thank you so much for being here with us. My pleasure. Um, so you're a climber. Yes. You're also an engineer, biophysicist, and um, you designed your own prosthesis. I did, I yeah. did in fact. <laughs> uh, to be able to pursue your passion for climbing after an accident left you empty. Right. Uh, so climbing was really at the center of your life. It is still. Uh, we can consider it was the end of something and the beginning of something really new and challenging because you went to Harvard, you went to the MIT to learn how to actually build them and you were not even the scholar type, <laughs> I guess. That's true, So Very can true. you can you just tell us about this really unexpected journey? Yeah, I, as you stated, I, I, I was not uh, a scholarly person uh, <laughs> prior to my mountain climbing accident. Um, I, if I was lucky, I got D's and C's in my classes. And, but afterwards, I redesigned my limbs for the vertical world of rock and ice climbing. Yep. And to my surprise and everyone's surprise, I climbed even better uh, with artificial limbs than I achieved with mere biological limbs before the accident. So this inspired me uh, so much because I realized technology has the power to heal, to rehabilitate, and in my case, even extend human capability beyond innate physiological levels. Yeah. So this motivated me to go back to school and actually, for the first time, take my studying seriously. <laughs> and quite seriously, <laughs> in my <True>. turn of it. <laughs> uh, so what is so special about your bionics? Um, these are the only commercial uh, legs in the world that are powered. Yeah. So all other foot ankle prostheses are human powered, like yep. a bicycle's human powered. Uh, but these have small computers and a muscle tendon like actuator mm -hmm. that as I walk, uh, I receive very high torques and resistance and power. So they actually inject muscle like mm -hmm. energy into my movements, and therefore my movements are, are normal. So we've normalized walking speed and yeah. metabolic rate and all these parameters. Um, so it's interesting, if you put a box around a human being and you measure how fast they walk and how much energy they use, you really don't know whether they have biological limbs or bionic limbs, which is a, a fun accomplishment. Yeah, and an amazing one as well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and do you think, um, do you think these bionics could benefit people in general? Do you think you can actually yeah, go I to the public I think with the, them? Bionic technologies will ultimately impact um, every human on the, in the world. So I mentioned in my, in my lecture, Indeed. we're developing bionic shoes as an example that can be used by, by anyone mm. that make walking and running easier. It's like when you're at the airport and you hit the moving walkway and then it's like you're moving very, very fast and then you get off the walkway and you're like, my gosh, walking so strenuous and slow. Yeah. <laughs> So we're basically building bionic shoes that you can experience that always when you walk in room. And you're um, developing a brand new uh, discipline that's called biomegatronic as well. Can you tell us how it works and how you work actually? How, how Do you just watch people and try to replicate the human movement? Uh, I think it's, a, yep. it's biophysicist and design at the same time. Right, most of the time the strategy is to deeply understand scientifically how um, the biological body works mm -hmm. um, and then to apply those principles to the design of body parts made of synthetics. All right. Um, but you can also go the other way, you can use design to inform new biology. Um, my colleagues in synthetic biology, for example, um, move in the opposite direction. So bionics, um, is very, very broad, and it's this beautiful marriage and interplay between um, biological science and, and design. So during your talk, you were mentioning your friend who received these special prosthesis, and he was pretty much the first one to have them. Uh, and you said he, and I quote, uh, the robot was part of me, that's what he said. Is that the true definition of a cyborg? Is this making it, it one? Is, it is my definition, yes. Yeah. yeah. So when you that bi-directionality between the brain, the nervous system, and the design mechatronics. Um, when it's bi-directional, when you can actually feel the mechatronics, like you feel your biological yeah, body when you touch and proprioception, yeah. then, um, then, it's, then it's cyborg. And the th our theory is that with that bi-directionality, uh, a person's identity and self-image and body image changes to include 
the, the new design body part. Indeed, and that actually um, interrogates the way we see the body, the way exactly. we actually and yeah, it introduces, value it. It introduces the idea that in this century, we will have technologies to be able to sculpt our very own bodies mm. into all types of structures and morphologies, even non-anthropomorphic structures like wings. So I, I think in a hundred years, humans will be unrecognizable from what we are today. Yes, because you are also working on human augmentation. It's not just about correct. amputation. That's correct. So how do you foresee the human of the future? <laughs> how, how do you imagine it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it'll be fun. Um, you know, the, one of the great inventions of human history was, in my opinion, was the bicycle. And now we have the sport cycling. Yes. So in this century, yeah. we're going to see a number of different augmentations that will lead to new sports. You know, augment runnings, there'll be power running sports, augment climbing, power climbing, and yeah. so on. Um, so it's, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. And just, you know, there's the augmentation part, and then the assistive part, rehabilitative part, is just wonderful. I mean, the yeah. amount of suffering in the world because people have paralysis and amputation and blindness and depression and schizophrenia and so on is so profound. And it's such a wonderful use of science and technology and business to mitigate and, and solve uh, human limitation. And do you see a limit? How far should it go, do you think? Do you think? Yeah, I, I think as long as the individual is in control, the individual owns their own body, mm -hmm. and we're not, the world isn't imposing interventions uh, on the individual. The individual decides and actually has ownership of their own data, their own body, where we have a deep respect uh, to individual freedoms and rights. As long as we adhere to such rights, I, I believe we will be okay. Um, there's always inappropriate uses of technology, so of course we'll need policy around future augmentation technologies, but I think we'll largely get it right and um, really give this wonderful gift to humanity of, of eliminating disability. All right. Um, so, of course, the ethical part is a, you should be part of the discussion. Uh, do you think scientists and researchers have a much more important role to play in these type of discussions? Do you think? Because yeah. it involves our mm -hmm. very own making. Sure. I, I think uh, there, there needs to be a number of stakeholders involved in the conversation, um, a large number of stakeholders. Mm. Of, co of course, scientists play a critical role, um, as well as legal scholars, or scholars and policymakers and so on. Mm. You know, often people outside of the scientific community believe something's possible when it's not, um, believe something that's, that, that's going to happen uh, in the near future and it yeah. will not. And often they believe something, um, you know, is impossible. And when in fact it's not only possible, it's already here. <laughs> so uh, at a minimum, scientists are important to, um, to introduce um, the facts and what's actually happening, what's possible. Um, and I, I think, you know, there's been a, um, a mentality within technologists that if you can build it, it's super cool and we should just do it. And, and I think uh, us technologists have to really think very, very critically and carefully about what we build, um, its unintended consequences and uses, and whether the nefarious, um, inappropriate uses of such technology um, are very small compared to the what, how society may benefit yeah, from benefits. new technology. Mm. Well, of course, we can't get to the bottom of this, and I can only just invite everyone to watch your talk, because you just open our eyes on huge possibilities. Well, thank you. I'll just end with a quick personal question. You seem like the kind of people who can take up a challenge, or several. <laughs> <laughs> what will be the next one? Oh, gosh, I have about... <laughs> Um, what I spoke on today was a, a small fraction of my projects. <laughs> I probably have 50 yeah. projects. It's crazy. It's, you know, juggling. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm very, very passionate about all the interfaces between synthetics and our bodies. Yeah. So mechanical interfaces, how do we attach things to our body where they're comfortable? 
is a passion of mine. So many people are in pain because of the interface between the prosthesis and the body or the shoe in the body, or the bra in the body, or anything that touches us is often not designed properly. So we're trying to solve that, and of course, linking to the brain, neural interfaces, and also dynamics, building uh, body parts that move like us, that think like us. So each of those areas, I'm challenged and enthralled. Yes, that will be quite the journey. <laughs> Thank you Thank so you. much. Cheers. <laughs>